All right, friends. It's so nice to see you all um, and to share space with you tonight. Um, my name is Tammy Ortiz, and um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and they, them, theirs. And I am a sociology master's student at the University of Northern Colorado. Um, we're in Northern Colorado, Greeley, about 50 miles from Denver. And um, I am a graduate assistant at the Center for Women's and Gender Equity. So I just wanted to thank you all for coming tonight. We'll probably have some more people trickle in, um, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and read Tanya's bio and then I'll pass it over to Tanya to get us started. Um, let me get it, got it pulled up. Inspired by her experience as a single working mother living in a marginalized community, Tanya Denise Fields founded the Black Feminist Project formerly the BLK project in 2009, as a response to sexist institutional policies, structural reinforced cycles of poverty and harsh inequity, inequities in wealth and access to capital that result in far too many women being unable to rise out of poverty and sustain their families. The group's work has been covered by the New York Times and MSNBC's The Melissa Harris Perry Show, the New York Daily News and numerous other print and digital platforms. Tanya's numerous fellowships and commitments in professional development has connected her with a national cohort of social justice change agents with a bachelor in political science from Baruch College and a talent for public speaking, blogging, and singing. Tanya has become a sought after public speaker. She, she provided widely praised, praised keynote speeches at the 2012 Just Food Conference, the City University of New York School of Professional Studies 2013 commencement, and the Marlin Institute's Connecting Through Chains Conference and the 2016 Green Thumb Conference grow together. To just name a few. She has served on several plenary, plenary, plenary panels and led and facilitated workshops across the country. Previous to the Black Feminist Project, Tanya worked with several high profile and environmental organizations located in the South Bronx. Mothers on the Move, Sustainable South Bronx, and the Marjorie, Marjorie Carter Group. Tanya built, I lost my thing. Tanya built the network skills, resources, and knowledge she gained through those experiences to create the Black Feminist Project. She is, she is rep, a reputed and rising public speaker and educator. She has spoken, conducted workshops, and participated on panels at Just Food Annual Conference, NCFA, New York, Winter Conference, Manhattanville College, Kingsborough College, Brooklyn Food, Co Food Coalition, News Ugg, and others. In addition to her work as a nonprofit and community leader, she is a thought leader, cultural influencer, and social media personality. With a strong following on Facebook, Twitter, and Twitter, and also Instagram, um, Tanya created and stars in Mama Tanya's Kitchen, a web-based cooking and lifestyle show. With a heaping amount of humor and a clash of sass, Tanya teaches viewers how to cook affordably, diverse meats with cook affordable, diverse meats with gourmet flair. Her episodes and Facebook Lives are popular and attract attention in the food world and beyond. She is, some, she is a sometimes writer, previously writing column on food and food justice for Ebony.com, giving astute commentary on radical Black motherhood and fashions herself, and fashions herself a ratchet feminist. She has also contributed a chapter for the book, The Next Eco, War Eco Warriors by Emily Hunter, and has been cited in many other academic and educational texts. You can find Tanya, the Black Feminist Project, and Mama Tanya's Kitchen on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Ooh, awesome. Um, so excited um, to bring Tanya here. So I'll just pass it over to Tanya. You know, that was it. That's the post. Everybody go home. She read you my full, like, 800-word bio. Y'all don't need to hear anything else from me. That's it. <laughs> so thank you all for being here. My name is Tanya Denise Fields. Most people refer to me online as Mama Tanya. People refer to me offline as Mama Tanya too. So it's kind of become a name that has stuck. Uh, I am really excited uh, to be here. Thank you all for inviting me. Uh, when Tammy first reached out to me and uh, sort of asked me, um, you know, to do this, I was like, well, what do you want me to do it on? And uh, totally sort of left it completely up to me. Um, and so I was like, girl, I don't know if you want to do that. <laughs> but, you know, she was like, no, I do. So here we are. Um, 
And so, you know, I am essentially just coming to y'all sort of tonight to talk to you about a variety of different things that sort of all swirl around this idea of Black womanhood and Black femhood. Um, if I had to title it as a thesis, it probably would be called Ratchet as Praxis, Rejecting Respectability Politics and Subverting Misogynoir as a Form of Reclaiming Black Women's Full Personhood. Um, and so <laughs> some of you are probably like, ratchet is praxis. What does that even mean? Well, we all probably know what ratchet is, right? But some of us might not know what praxis is. Praxis literally means the application of theory, right? And so, you know, the application of theory will only allow for us to become masters of whatever it is that we are practicing. I am practicing mastering ratchetness, right? <laughs> because I think that it, for me, it is a very intentional way of uh, subverting and rejecting respectability politics. Um, and so one is like respectability politics. That doesn't seem bad. Don't we all wanna be respectable people? Well, respectability politics is a school of thought that utilizes the respectability narratives as the basis for enacting social, political, and legal change. What is a respectability narrative? Respectability narratives are representations of marginalized individuals meant to construct an image of marginalized groups as people sharing similar traits, values, morals with the dominant group. Again, that doesn't sound terrible, right? Let me dive a little deeper for y'all before I get into this deck that I'm gonna show y'all that will also then just sort of explain like who the hell I am and why y'all are here on a Friday night, <laughs> you know, at six o'clock your time, but it's eight o'clock my time. I probably should be doing something else, right? But co Corona, so this seems like a perfect thing to do on a Friday night, but um, the term respect, the term politics of respectability was coined by Professor Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, okay, in her 1993 book, Righteous Discontent, The Women's Movement in the Black Baptist Church, 1880 through 1920. In this book, she examines the use of respectability narratives by Black Baptist women to counter the images of Black Americans as lazy, shiftless, stupid, and immoral in popular culture, right? And this is something, this book was written in 1993. She's unpacking things that happened in 1880, and here we are in 2021, and this is still relevant, right? This idea that we need to counter all of these images, right? And so she was unpacking this in her book, and there was this you know, particularly in the Baptist church um, by Bap Black Baptist women, right? And so how we engage in this as an appeal for both societal acceptance and equal legal protection. So there's this negative stereotype or the problem narrative, right? That Professor Angela Banks describes in respectability and the quest for citizenship, because this doesn't just apply to black people. Respectability narratives and respectability politics apply to lots of folks. I just happen to stay in my lane and talk about black people because that is what's near and dear to me. That is the experience that I have. And I think that people are inherently uh, capable of speaking to their own lived experiences. So why should I be speaking to their lived experiences? is when I can speak to my own. But that's neither here nor there, right? What I'm, what I'm trying to flesh out with you, however, is that it isn't just something that's inherent to Black people, although as I talk to you tonight, I'm going to do it through an unapologetic Black female lens, Black femme lens. But if you want to think about the ways that it, that it shows up in, uh, in our culture in ways that we might have internalized as acceptable, walk with me here, right? So Professor Angela Banks describes in respectability and the quest for citizenship that it exists in every marginalized group. She gives the example of the narrative of undocumented immigrants being a financial strain on the government and that activists supporting the dreamers combat this respect with respect the res combat this with this respectability narrative of dreamers as academically successful self-sufficient young people who also believe in the American dream. That's a respectability narrative. And it's probably one that many of us, even people who might actually be affected by the DREAM Act have regurgitated over and over and over again. This idea that in order to be granted citizenship, one must jump through all of these hoops to prove to the dominant group 
that, hey, look, I'm just like you. I value education. I'm not a delinquent. I'm not a racist. We don't need to build a wall. I'm not scary. I'm a good person. And that performing that respectability narrative is actually the thing that makes one worthy of citizenship, right? Um, and so this sort of serves to corral both public and legislative support for desired initiatives such as immigration reform. Now, respectability politics may have wielded some positive outcomes, um, but it also upholds problematic ideas about the worthiness of a marginalized group and how they should be evaluated. That is by the values of respectability set by the dominant class, right, around these metrics that the dominant class has created. It also equates achieving this specific definition of worthiness as both the reason for deserving equality and an effective countermeasure to underlying prejudices. So here's the thing, because of that, then respectability politics become a weapon, right? It gets to be wielded by the dominant class to control the actions and justify the harm of marginalized people. You didn't act correctly, so because of such, I can do all of these things to you. Sound familiar? When we're talking about Black Lives Matter, when we're talking about all Black Lives Matter, right? This idea that because someone ran, they must be guilty because someone looks a certain way, that in and of itself is probable cause to illegal search and seizure, right? If you don't speak a certain way, you are not worthy of being able to utilize any number of platforms in order to talk about your lived experiences and the negative impacts of oppression, right? And so it encompasses everything from speech patterns, dress codes, food choices, protesting etiquette and media persona, right? It's constantly subject to change. That's the other thing. The dominant group can constantly ensure that marginalized groups never actually meet the facet of these rules because the dominant group will just keep changing the fucking rules, right? So when one says, I don't actually think there's anything wrong with respectability politics, I actually challenge those folks to rethink it because respectability politics shifts responsibility away from the perpetrators and puts the onus on those who are negatively affected by oppression, right? And oppression that they did not create. For those who believe in it, it creates a false sense of security, right? Do I have to remind anyone that Martin Luther King was as respectable as they come and he died in a suit? right? Gene Botham was sitting in his home. He had a great job. He was a very respectable person, first, gen first generation immigrant, right? Indicative of what, what we think about when we talk about, you know, the, the utility and usefulness of, of, of immigrants in this country. And he was killed eating ice cream in his own apartment, right? Uh, Atiana Jefferson was babysitting her nephew, right? The epitome of family values, you know, taking care of someone being a good representation of elders in our family. And she was shot through a window in her home. Jonathan Price, right? Which is a more a lesser known case who by all accounts of his own volition on his own social media talked about all of the, 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 the um, benefits of respectability politics, right? He had, one could debatably say that he had internalized quite a bit of anti-blackness. And then he found himself shot four times in the torso after trying to shake the hand of the police officer who would kill him after he had broken up a fight and wanted to explain to the police officer what had happened. Respectability politics do not work. That's the most important part of all of this, right? You can do all of these things. You can sing the right songs. You can do the right dance. You can wear the right clothes. You can speak the right way. You can code switch when you feel that it's appropriate. And when discrimination and prejudice and violence come for you, they are coming for you based on one thing and one thing only, the representation of whatever your skin color, ethnicity, gender, gender expression, sexual expression mean to the dominant group. And for that reason, I am someone who has decided some time ago to very intentionally and unapologetically reject respectability politics. 
someone who says, I will go speak to kids at a college with grills in my mouth, right? Who refuses to code switch, who will use a language that is inherent and comfortable to me. And I will challenge you to not somehow think that that, because it makes you uncomfortable, because it is not a representation of the dominant group, somehow mean that anything that I'm sharing with you becomes any less true, any less effective, any less worthy, any less valuable. I am going to uh, share my screen with you. And now I'm gonna actually tell you who the fuck I am because I know y'all are like, this is great. Wow, she's 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 a fun date. Um, but who is she? Um, so Mama Tanya, Tanya Denise Fields, the woman, the brand, and the ratchet. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself to you. I'm going to talk to you about what it is that I do, the people that I do it with, some of the personal experiences that make up uh, what, what I am doing with my squad right now, okay? Um, and so a quick intro. I am the mom of six kids, ages 18 to five. I always leave with that, right? I'm going to give you, you know, sort of all of these, all of these sort of, uh, you know, things that we look at, um, that are framed very much as statistics, right? Because I really, you know, and I do this very intentionally because I want for folks to really challenge themselves around the way that they show up in spaces and the ways in which we think about black women, right? Many of us have internalized massage noir. Yes, even us good folks who proclaim to be radical feminists, who proclaim to be womanists, we also internalize massage noir, right? And one may ask, what in the hell is massage noir? I'm sorry, did I just close out of that? So massage noir is sort of this idea that this is where sort of race and gender intersect and they cannot be inexplic they cannot be sort of mutually exclusive of one another. I cannot show up as black first and I cannot show up as a woman first. I show up as a black woman. And therefore there are experiences um, that are unique to that sort of that sort of identity. Uh, are you guys still seeing my are you guys still seeing my screen? Or did it, yeah? Okay. Great. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So I've been a community activist for the last 15 years in the New York area, sort of really hunkered down in the Southeast Bronx, which is one of the poorest congressional districts in the country. We always sort of vacillate between being number one, number three, and number five, but we're always there in that top five, right? Um, and that's sort of been our our statistic for the last 40 years. And it's something that still annoys me, you know, that 40 years later, right, from when the Bronx was burning, we're still one of the poorest congressional districts. Um, I'm a Harlem native. Uh, and I say that I ended up here in the Bronx by way of uh, gentrification. So I moved here when I was 22 years old, um, a young mom of one. Uh, by the time I was 23, I had two. I was putting myself through school, through the CUNY system. Um, I was working any variety of one or two jobs uh, while also putting myself through school and trying to raise two very small children. Um, in 2010, I founded uh, the Black Feminist Project, which I still currently lead. I am currently leading, I mean, building the Mama Tanya brand, and I will twerk absolutely anywhere. Um, so what does the grind look like? Like, sis, you doing the most. Like, my grandmother, God rest her soul, was like, I actually don't know what you do for a living, but I see you on TV a lot, so you must be okay. Um... So there are a lot of moving parts to what this looks like. And I don't think that this is um, inherently unique. I think what is unique is that we don't share enough stories of women like myself, the Mama Tanyas, the Auntie Tanisha's, the, the you know, the, the, the TT Maria's who are doing this, who have jobs, who braid hair, who do nails, who also started, you know, uh, the first Girl Scout troop in their community in the last 20 years. I am not unique, right? What is unique is how intentional this society is about denying women like me uh, our full personhood and humanity. 
So for the last 10 years, I've slowly and diligently been cre creating a brand that is unapologetically radical, it's feminist, it's black as fuck. It is a brand that mirrors my politic of disrupting the status quo, dismantling respectability politics, and cultivating ratchet radical joy. I'm a hustler, and I think that many black femmes are as well, because we have to be right? In order for us to cultivate radical joy in our lives, it almost demands that we hustle because a lot of times what it requires of us is to move out of these traditional spaces that almost uh, force us into code switching, force us into performing respectability politics, force us to adopt respectability narratives. And oftentimes in the face of explicit and implicit misogynoir and microaggressions. So the Black Feminist Project, <laughs> what do we do there? Uh, we have quite a few, a few programs at the, at the Black Feminist Project. One of our most visible um, that people know about the most and think it's the totality of what we do is our farm, uh, the Black Joy Farm but it's not the totality of what we do. Um, uh, so that is a 5,400 square foot lot that we turned into a farm. And we use that term very intentionally. I do not call it a community garden. It is open to the community, but it is a farm. We grow food for the purposes of creating added value product and or reselling to the community. People from the community who get involved and help us build this farm, create programming, um, enact and execute that programming, then get access to that food at no cost through what we call sweat equity, right? This idea that their labor is worth something in a capitalist society. And therefore, our firm belief is that food is a human right and nobody should pay for food. I said what I said. Nobody should pay for food. But capitalist society being what it is, we do have to pay for food. Um, and so one of the ways in which we subvert a commodified, globalized, racist food system is to grow food in our neighborhood, um, led and informed by the people of our community using um, the voluntary um, work of folks in our community, but also creating economic development opportunities where we can pay people um, something, where we can share profit and revenue. Um, and so that farm is located on Simpson Street, right off of 163rd. We keep chickens. Um, we got bees this year. Uh, we have a greenhouse. We grow all manners of vegetables. Um, it's a super dope, fun place to be. It is our radical, um, unpoliced green space. That is what we call it. Um, one of our other programs is Sis Do You. Sis Do You is an empowerment program for women, uh, for young women, uh, teen girls, and marginalized genders. Marginalized genders, for anyone who may not be familiar with that term, really are folks who identify, because we, we all know that gender is a spectrum, right? We all know that. We know that gender is not a binary, right? That finally science is catching up to what, like, all of our ancestors have known right? And that gender, this gender binary was absolutely created by, you know, capitalist, cisgendered, able-bodied, evil capitalist white men. Y'all know that, right? Okay. Because if not, let me know so you can get like me and know that gender is a spectrum. It is not a binary, right? And now we are starting to see that science absolutely supports that. Um, and so in that spectrum, folks who do not identify as men, right? are what we would call marginalized genders. Um, and sort of it's sort of a more gender expansive and inclusive term um, that is picking up some steam, but that not everybody is necessarily familiar with because some people may not necessarily identify as femme, but they don't identify as men either, right? Um, and so this program is for, for those folks ages 14 through 30. Um, it started out as an in-person dinner program. Then um, COVID said, no, no, no. So we don't have in-person dinners right now. We are doing uh, digital dinners um, where participants receive dinner money from us so they can buy themselves dinner or use it for whatever they want. We believe that folks inherently know how to take care of themselves. Um, and so uh, we will... Uh, 
you know, give folks that that sort of like mutual aid or stipend or whatever you want to call it. And then we will get together um, one Friday out of every month to talk about the things that deeply impact us. Um, and those things change. It can be academic. It can be more uh, it can be more personal based. Um, but the point is that what it has to do is enrich the lives of its participants and it needs to show up in a joyful way. Um, so uh, April 9th, we will be having um, a woman named Pamelia Battle Turk, who is the owner of Souk's Heavenly Bombs and Butter, joining us to show folks how to create their own signature body butters. And then we're going to give the first 25 participants some money to have dinner while they watch this workshop. So that's the kind of stuff that we do. And the reason that we do that, the reason that radical joy is an explicit part of our mention is this idea, right? When we talk about respectability narratives, when we talk about respectability pol uh, uh, politics, when we talk about this idea of misogynoir, one of the ways that misogynoir shows up is this idea that black women and black femmes are inherently mules, right? That our purpose in society is to serve others to the detriment of ourselves, of the people that we are charged of caring for and our communities, right? And that's both outside of our community and intracommunally. We see femme presenting black people as folks who are only here for service, right? And one of the things that I wanted to be very careful of when I created the Black Feminist Project was not perpetuating that again. Many times we pathologize black womanhood. We pathologize Black femhood. We pathologize Black childhood, right? I think that Black childhood is almost like a, it's like a, a, a contradiction because we don't even see Black children as worthy of having a childhood. We, 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 we adultify them very early on. That's why when a child is playing with a toy gun in an open carry state, he's not just a child playing with a toy gun. He is a man who has a weapon and is worthy of being shot within two seconds of non-interaction. That was literally a result, a reflection, a manifestation of us not seeing black children as children, but instead as these big scary beings. And so the same can be said, something similar can be said for black womanhood. This idea that the only time that black women and black femmes in a capitalist society have any value is when they are actually taking their labor and enriching somebody else's life. And then the sort of strange and bizarre and violent ways in which we stigmatize and malign and subjugate black women who seek to use their labor to uh, enrich themselves, to create comfort in their own lives. The ways in which we, and when I say we, I mean all of us, including other black people, actually have very sort of vitriolic reactions to black women who desire comfort who are intentional about being joyful, right? It's like, this is why black women on a wine tour will get kicked off of it because they're laughing too loudly, right? Because this idea that a group of black women who get together and actually enjoy themselves are somehow seen as offensive and dangerous. The very act of black women engaging in joy is dangerous. I want for us to think about just how warped that is just how deep down the misogynistic rabbit hole one must go, that laughing black women is dangerous. I experienced this in my own life, that when I go someplace and I'm talking to friends, people will continue to turn around and look at me. Now, I counter that now by actually confronting people. Are you okay? Do you need something? You all right? Is my laughing bothering you? And what happens is it shames people because this strange thing, and it's not making excuses for folks, is that people don't actually realize that they're doing that. They don't actually even understand. That's why it's so pervasive. I grew up around white people. I was bused into school. There is nothing louder than a bunch of cackling Karens, but it seems like that never seems to bother anybody. But anytime Black people seem to show up anywhere and talk anything above a whisper, anytime we take up space, 
then you will see all of these strange interactions that happen. And many of them actually end up resulting in violence against black bodies. And so I wanted to make sure in our mission that we became a place of respite, that we became a place that said, black femmes, we see you and you are worth more than just what you can do for other folks. And we don't need you to show up and do anything other than exist because you are inherently worthy of comfort. You are inherently worthy of joy. And one of the most radical and revolutionary things that we can do as we build community is come together and create safe and courageous spaces to be joyful in. Um, and so sis do you is a reflection of that. One of the things that we also do that is sort of informal but pretty consistent is that since Corona um, and her raggedy ass has become a, a, a real life thing <laughs> and she doesn't seem to want to go away. And in fact, she's inviting all her little raggedy ass cousins in the forms of Corona variants is that we give out mutual aid. We knew, I knew that uh, when America gets a cold, Black America gets the flu. So when America got COVID, I knew that Black America was going to end up dying. Um, and I knew that the disparities that were there were going to become even bigger, right? And I don't know why everyone was acting all shocked. I don't know why the media always presents this as if it's new, because we've seen it time and time again. We saw it with uh, Hurricane Sandy here in, 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 in New York. We saw it with Hurricane Katrina. We have seen it with all of these different um, uh, sort of acts of God or natural disasters or, you know, sort of crisis that pop up. And all of a sudden the veil, the pretense falls away and the chasm of disparities are laid bare, right? They are very obvious. Now, Folks in the black community, this was no surprise to any of us, but everybody else seems so shocked. And I think part of the shock was because now all of a sudden it wasn't just coming for black Americans anymore. It was coming for middle American white folks too, right? Um, who also engage in their own, their, their own respectability narratives so that they can continue to be a part of and benefit from whiteness. Um, but my concern was to make sure that black people were taken care of. Um, and so what we started to do as we raised funds was to then turn around and say that we're not gonna do what a lot of nonprofits do, which is actually to recreate the system of harm that they're supposed to be combating, right? So you get like, Catholic charities here in New York that will pop up and give you rent relief, but you got to come in with all your backed up rent and you got to be in housing court already. And you got to show that you're on welfare and you got to come in looking busted and broke. Like all of these different ways in which you have to perform poverty and perform need to show that you are actually worthy of help. And that onus is quite often disproportionately placed on black femmes including by other black people. So we were like, no, no, no. If you are a black femme and you say that you need help, then we will help you. I had one woman who asked me, do you not need to know what she said? She, so she, she made a request and then uh, I said, okay, well, how much do you need? The very curious thing too is that people will say, all of these things are happening to me. And then I will say, well, how much do you need? And they'll be like, $200. And I'll be like, girl, you cannot put gas in your car, feed your family, get to work, do your nails, because I believe in that. <laughs> That's legitimate. Um, on $200. Black women have internalized, black femmes have internalized this so much that they are literally afraid to ask for what they need even when there's someone who is willing to give them help. And so oftentimes we will have to actually then shoot back to those who are requesting and say, $200 is not gonna be enough to meet your needs and you will be back here in a week or you will be in crisis again in a week and our help will be moot. And so oftentimes we will end up giving black femmes more than what they asked for because they're afraid or, to ask for what they need. So those are some of the things that we engage in. Um, one of the more uh, really dope uh, um, 
uh, developments is that we uh, are next month opening the Alice Fields Community Center for Black Women, Girls, and Marginalized Genders. Um, so we have secured a storefront space um, that is currently being prepared by the landlord that will be opening in a year. But in that year's time, we are opening in a um, in a temporary space that is about the same size where we will now have a brick and mortar place to do direct services, um, to do, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of s small self-determining food community and economies work, um, as well as community building and uh, political organizing. So we're really excited about that. Um, and so we are moving in in mid-April um, and our permanent space will be uh, opening in 2022. Um, and so that is, those are sort of the pillars and the anchors of the Black Feminist Project. Um, the other thing that we do um, is Mama Tanya's Kitchen. That's, I say we, but it's really just me. Um, and so Mama Tanya's Kitchen um, is a... Uh, lifestyle and uh, food uh, br genre uh, uh, brand. Um, it's inconsistent because I run a whole organization. I have six children. Um, and, uh, uh, but I, you know, Mama Tani's Kitchen came out of um, these food demonstrations that I used to do called, I'm sorry, excuse me, give me one second. I apologize. Sorry, you know. We love you. New, thank you. This new world where we're all doing all this stuff virtually, you know, get like a got like a grocery delivery and the dog is barking and and you're trying to like be all professional. Um <laughs> it's like stop pretending everybody can hear the fucking dog barking. Just go deal with it. Um in any event. So Mama Tani's Kitchen is a lifestyle and food brand. It uh sort of came about from these um, these food demonstrations that I used to do. So back in 2014, 2015, we had a bus, the South Bronx Mobile Market. We would take this bus and go park outside of fast food restaurants and we would do cooking demonstrations and give away food to people um, and just ask that they give a suggested donation, but we never turned anybody away. Um, and I would do this as a way of subverting people in my community away from fast food restaurants um, and really um, encouraging this idea that we already know how to cook. Like, don't let capitalism, which has stolen your food pathways from you, commodified it, you know, bastardized it, you know, homogenized it, you know, whiteified it. Um, and then repurposed it back to you and told you that you didn't actually know how to eat. Listen, black people taught folks how to eat. Indigenous people taught folks how to eat here, right? Have y'all seen old American food, like food Americana? It's like mayonnaise and jello and Vienna sausages. It's gross shit. And I just don't understand how white people spent all this time colonizing the world for spices and nobody ever uses those shits. So, we know how to cook, right? And so it was this idea that I was going to help folks remember that we knew how to cook. And I was also going to lovingly explain to folks the ways in which capitalism has actually stolen their health from them and the ways in which we could reclaim it. And the cooking demonstrations became so popular that people started asking me to come to different places and do them. And then people started saying, well, can you actually just like make YouTube videos? And I've made a couple of YouTube videos, but I really like Instagram and doing like these little 10 minute shorts. Um, and I have a Patreon that I update you know, irregularly with longer um, videos, but it's become a great place for folks to just come and talk about food. And the feel really is that you stop by my house over here on East 60, 167th Street in the Bronx, in the Morrisania section of the Bronx, and you came into my kitchen and we're going to talk about the foolishness that's happening um, at the Capitol. And we're going to talk about pop, 
you know, pop culture. And we're going to talk about what's popping on black Twitter. And I'm going to show you how to make a rum cake, or I'm going to show you how to make a duck in an air fryer. And so it's really the intersection of sort of radical food politic and lifestyle branding. And so, um, I've been just slowly building that and 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 just taking my time with it. Um, and so that has occupied my time. Um, and I've become just as visible for Mama Tiny's Kitchen as I have for the Black Feminist Project. Uh, Tasty's BuzzFeed has hired me to do a couple of promo spots. And so that's been fun. Um, and I'm currently working on some other things that I can't disclose of, but hopefully, you know, this is just going to get bigger. Not hopefully, I believe in manifesting. This is getting bigger and bigger. Um, and so you can find Mama Tati's Kitchen on Instagram. That's kind of where I live. Um, uh, and it, I'm currently working on all of this branding stuff and building out the website. Um, and then there's Mama Tanya After Dark. And if you thought Mama Tanya's Kitchen was inconsistent, Mama Tanya After Dark kind of doesn't even exist really, but it does. Um, and so Mama Tanya After Dark is a podcast. We have we have about four episodes that are on Apple Podcasts and are on Spotify. Um, we're building out the website that it can, so it can live there as well, where Black women and femmes get together and talk about all the ooey, gooey, delicious, salacious, controversial, stuff in the most ratchet way we feel comfortable. And so I don't do any of these things without a team of folks, right? People are always like, oh my God, Mama Tanya, how do you do this, especially with six kids? Well, my kids also help me build this business. My daughter, uh, both of my older daughters work for my organization. They get paid and they have to clock hours. And if they don't clock hours, they don't get paid. You know, my, my second eldest did not get paid last uh, pay period. Today she came in and she was like, I'm in staff meeting. What do you need me to do? What's the next steps? Volunteering to work on projects because I'm not playing. This is a job. You don't work, you don't get paid. Um, and so, you know, she works on the social media piece. My eldest daughter who is actually, she looks like the oldest, but she's not. This is, this is my eldest daughter, Taylor. She's in her first year of college. She also is pretty crafty with uh, a camera and editing. She's going to school for communications. So she uh, works on a lot of our graphic stuff for the Black Feminist Project. She uh, um, does a lot of the camera op work and editing work for Mama Tani's Kitchen. My son has taught himself how to make beats. Um, and so he um, does all of our soundtrack. Uh, for our videos. And this little lady right here, Lola, actually is uh, becoming a burgeoning cook. Um, and so uh, she is my PA. She does all my chopping, my slicing, my prep work, and then oftentimes will help me on camera. And the only responsibility these two little people have is to be quiet. Um, and then this is my staff, which, uh, you know, has actually changed a little bit since this picture and has actually grown. We have three additional staff members. We are a team of eight now. Um, it is a uh, ragtag group of queer, non-binary, black and brown folk. Um, and then my boyfriend, who is my boyfriend and whose job is to support me and buy me gifts, also... Um, works in media and works for a little show called Jesus and Miro on Showtime. And he puts together all of our, um, puts together all of our um, tech, uh, video tech stuff. So buys all of the equipment we need, tells me what stuff goes well, trains my daughter on how to use that uh, video uh, equipment stuff. And when his schedule allows him to, he will also step in and do camera op work. Um, and so these are sort of the important relationships that sustain the work that I do. One of the sort of things that have come up um, in this work uh, as well is that I am a big advocate um, uh, around being body positive and um, being a, a fativist. Um, I don't think it's enough to say body positive because I think that um, the body positivity movement has gotten hijacked by people who do not inhabit fat bodies. Um, and um, fatness is an identity and it shows up in some very key ways in society. Um, and thinness is a currency um, and fatness can be a liability. 
um, fat bodies are often um, discriminated against. They experience violence at higher rates. They are not believed when they report violence. They are not seen as victims. You intersect that with blackness, right? And particularly a very specific type of blackness because even in blackness, this is a spectrum, right? The What, what anti-blackness does is that the closer you get to whiteness, even in complexion, you benefit to that proximity. So therefore, inversely, the further away you get from whiteness, the more you actually experience the detriments of anti-blackness. So if you are dark skin, tall as a woman, I stand at 5'10", and you are fat, you are actually seen, there is this conundrum where you are seen as dangerous, but then also actually much more susceptible to violence, sexual, and um and and physical um and i've had those experiences and when i have reported my uh ex um for domestic violence um actually was very like there's no apologies you know when people do not believe that i was beaten because how could a 5 10 300 pound parentheses dark skin black woman actually be beat up i'm supposed to be like teflon right <laughs> You know, like we, and we see this even in the medical establishment where black bodies, particularly fat black bodies are thought of as not actually experiencing as much pain, right? Who are thought of seeking medical help because they are more susceptible because they, they have more of a proclivity to be seeking drugs, all of these types of things, right? Um, and so at some point for myself, um, I decided, and it was a very personal decision, um, and a very political decision, however, that I've been unpacking very publicly because I am a fativist that I actually would change what my body looked like. So the Tanya on the right is Tanya at 295 pounds. And the Tanya on the left is Tanya at about 187 pounds. That's a little over a hundred pounds that I've lost in the last two years. Um, you know, actually doing this virtually was great for me because I'm actually wearing compression garments because two weeks ago, I, after losing 120 pounds and having all of this additional skin, had a tummy tuck and a breast lift. Um, and so I am recovering. I want y'all to know that it took a lot for me to get on this, 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 um, this, this, this Zoom with y'all because I am actually extremely tired these days. Tum, uh, this type of surgery, while it is, you know, BBLs, Brazilian butt lifts, tummy tucks, breast augmentation, you know, we, through the lens of social media, it seems like instant gratification. These are major surgeries. These, in some cases, can be dangerous surgeries if you have comorbidities um, that you have not disclosed to your doctor, your surgeon, if they don't know about them, if they don't have the totality of your uh, medical records. I chose to actually pay more for my, um, and then there's that, right? The fact that I had to pay for my surgery because uh, insurance kept saying, I don't actually need the surgery. Even though I was getting yeast infections, and I don't mean vaginal yeast infection, you can get yeast anywhere on your body. Anywhere that there is moisture for long periods of time, you can get yeast infections. So someone who already has a skin, uh, skin condition such as eczema, having extra skin that is hanging mid-belly, right? Where my breasts are, where they were landed, right? Um, and then it's, you know, moist under there. And you, I could, it's not possible for me as a mom of six, as a woman who's running several businesses to take showers two and three times a day. By the time I got home, it doesn't smell nice. It, I've got, you know, a couple of days later, I've got a yeast infection up under my stomach, what we like to call the FUPA. If no one knows what that means, you can Google it. <laughs> but um, that area right above your pubic bone, I have what they medically call a skin apron. So I had an additional four to five um, inches of skin hanging, right? Which was also very pleasant. And as a, you know, sexually active uh, uh, adult, is not fun either when you think, of, think about it in, in that respect. And here insurance was telling me as a person who still is dealing with what it means to be a fat person, right? Like the ramifications of having a larger body that this was not medically necessary. It was not medically necessary, right? And so after the third time submitting it and being denied, 
I actually just happened to have a windfall that, you know, paid me a significant amount of money. And I was able to actually pay for this surgery on my own. And I was actually not prepared for the fact that this is a major surgery that has real implications in terms of recovery, right? And what it also did for me was give me, right? I remember saying to my friend, bless my little ableist heart because I actually did not know what an ableist world we lived in. Like we have all the rhetoric, right? We know all the words, we talk all the smack and all the junk, right? Because we wanna be woke, but experiencing it is very differently. It was our, you know that, um, right. You know, since the pandemic, Wi-Fi has been very, has been pretty raggedy. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, sorry, y'all. Thanks for, for sticking around. Um, but I, what what was the last thing that I said? I don't remember. I, I remember just being like, oh, shit, why did my computer turn off? And then. <laughs> you were talking about ableism. And right. Yes. Thank you, uh, Kaya, Kaya. Did I pronounce that right? Kaya is good. Kaya, awesome. So, good. Um, so thank you, Kaya. Yes. Um, so I got to experience just in a very small way what it feels like to operate in this world and to not be able-bodied, not being able to push open doors, um, seats being too small because I had four drains coming out of my body. I look like Ock from Spider-Man, you know, all of these drains coming out of my body. Um, the fact that I could not stand for long periods of time because I have what's tantamount to like a hundred, um, sutras, uh, al along my bikini line. And so I could not stand up straight. So I have to, I still actually walk slightly bent over. I still can't stand up straight three weeks later. Um, and so, being places where there's no place for you to sit, right? Um, if you have a mobility issue, well, to hell with you. Um, you know, all of those different, all of those different things. And remember just being so frustrated. And actually, it's only been in the last couple of days where I've even felt a little okay going outside. I actually started to develop a fear of going outside because I was just like, outside is dangerous. <laughs> like I started to feel extremely vulnerable being outside because as a person who had less mobility and less physical ability, everything felt dangerous. There were all of these things that felt dangerous because you would think, I'm gonna use a mathematical term that actually might be a little bit offensive, but I don't mean it that way, but my mind is running a mile a minute. But this idea of the, um, like the smallest common denominator or the least common denominator, right? So this idea that those of us who are the most marginalized, are that's where we should start, right? So like, if you think about ID, industrial design, if we are going to design something, we should be designing things in mind with those of us who are the most marginalized. But that's literally not how capitalism in this like like works in this country. Where it's actually incentivized to actually create things for those of us who actually have the most, the most resources, the most ability, the most intellect. And then those of us who don't, and, and, I, and I mean intellect in a very sort of very sort of specific, like discriminatory way, because intelligence shows up in a myriad of ways, right? But again, that's a whole that's a whole nother Zoom on a whole nother day. Um, but what happens is because it's not set up that way, then capitalism gets to sell you all of those other things. Everything else becomes a premium, right? And then everybody else has to try to figure out ways to subvert these systems. Or what so often happens is you just get eaten up by that system and you pay. I mean, I mean, quite literally, you pay before it consumes you. Um, you know, James Baldwin talked about how it is very expensive to be poor. It is extremely expensive to be poor, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, I have been experiencing that throughout this body transformation. And I've talked very openly about the contradictions of what it means to have the privilege, because I have the privilege of being able to change my body. There are people who might want to be in a different body and they don't have the privilege of changing that body. So I acknowledge that I have the privilege of being able to change my body. I talk about the conflict of 
standing as a radical accomplice, and that's a term that I want to give y'all, right? Because I don't believe in this word ally. I think ally is too dil diluted a word. I think allyship is rooted in paternalism. I don't need any fucking allies. I need you to be an accomplice. If we are going to dismantle and bury the body of anti-blackness, motherfucker, you better be burying it with me and you better not snitch. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, we are in this shit together. Do you understand what I'm saying? If I go down, you going down too, right? Um, and I, I say that specifically for those of us who have privilege in whatever group we're in. I say that very specifically to white people, right? And the, the reason I make those two determinations is because white people, particularly able-bodied white people have the most privilege out of all of us. But we all have some privilege. If I go into a room full of folks and there are trans black women in that room, I'm the person in the room with the privilege. If I go into a room full of folks who uh, have differently abled or disabled bodies, I'm the person with the privilege in that room. If I identify as a heterosexual person in certain spaces, I'm the person with privilege in the room. Privilege, privilege it exists in a myriad of ways, right? And it's not static. Um, and there are, there's a spectrum, there's gradients to it, right? You know, in, in, in the words of the prophet Meek Mills, there's levels to this shit. You understand? So we got to understand what those levels look like. Um, and so I, I I think about what, you know, what that feels like when we go into spaces and we want to stand as allies. That's useless. We need to be standing as radical accomplices. Um, and so I, I want I want for y'all to kind of sit in that. Um, I know that we're getting ready to, we're getting close to that time where we're closing. My little, my, my, my narcissistic uh, pitch deck is, is done. That was it. Um, and so I, I wanted for us to take, I know there's like maybe 22 or 24 folks here on this. I was hoping that folks could maybe um, go uh, in breakout groups. And I want for us to just have a, just a brief discussion around some of these things that have come up respectability politics, respectability narratives, massage noir. What I'm also gonna do for you guys is that I did put together um, where, our, uh, where Your Voice, uh, which is an online magazine, has um, this great reading list. Where Your Voice Mag has this great reading list as a massage noir reading list, where they have all of these different articles um, to help you deepen your understanding of massage noir and how it shows up. I am going to put this link in the chat. You are all free to, I mean, it's, it's free online. So you're absolutely free to look at it, take it, snatch it. I want to share it with you um, as a resource because sometimes, you know, I, I talk to y'all for over an hour. I brought up all of these different um, concepts and some of them might be new. And even if they're not, it's all, you know, we always need to be in a state of, of, of awareness and introspection, right? One of the things about being a radical accomplice is that it can be exhausting. It's that's also one of the other reasons why I am very um, intentional about making sure that we um, pour joy um, and create joy for Black folks. Um, uh, because this idea that we're always unpacking and unlearning and challenging and checking in with ourselves, and it always needs to start with ourselves. We be so ready to check everybody else. I'll be like, girl, are you checking yourself though? Um, and that can be exhausting. Right. And it is uncomfortable. And we do need spaces where we can show up as our full selves, um, very, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, in our fullness and our wholeness in joyful ways and in intentionally joyful ways. So I'd like for us to go into those breakout groups. I want to say like 10 minutes to talk about some of this stuff that's come up. If there are any questions that you have, if there are things that really resonated for you, if there are things that didn't really resonate for you, um, maybe just have a brief discussion um, uh, amongst each other. And then at, I guess like 920, maybe we can come back and, and sort of do sort of a report back or sort of a, a, a Q and A. Does that sound good for folks? All right, awesome. I absolutely agree. Let's heighten the contradictions, y'all. I appreciate you all so much. Thank you for joining me tonight and just being in community. And I hope to hear from all of you very soon. And I hope that you have an amazing, um, uh, amazing weekend. The weekend here, uh, the weather here in New York is, is getting nice. 
And so I'm really excited about that while also just hoping that we all act like we have a little bit of sense and remember that even though we're over the pandemic, the pandemic isn't over. 